Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, uh, for the next 45 minutes, we're gonna talk about test-driven development for our APIs. Just a quick survey to get to know each other. Um, who's already hungry like me? Okay, good, um, I'm not the only one. So you might hear some weird noise from my stomach. Um, who, uh, which is way more important, who is familiar with test-driven development? Okay, some. Okay, maybe it's ne uh, necessary to get into some points in more detail. Um, um, okay, who of you is familiar with PyTest? Also, they're not familiar with test driven development, so, because most of my examples will be in PyTest. Just a few, okay. Uh, maybe should just uh, throw in some questions, something is not clear. Um, and what about your experience with APIs? Okay, most of them, that's good. Cool, so you're all API experts. Um, there's one of these test room development guys already achieved a great API with using test room development. Okay, none of you, oh, cool, interesting. So you all wanna have some better APIs. That's uh, cool. Um, yeah, let's, uh, oh, okay, it's gonna be loud when I'm coming closer. Let's get started, just a quick introduction, that's me. Um, um, I'm, yeah, that's my work outfit. Uh, I'm Michael Kuhner, I'm from Hamburg, Germany, as you might hear from my accent. I work as an independent uh, software engineer and um, I like Python and APIs and most of my projects are related to APIs and that's actually the reason why I came up with this talk. Uh, Cause in some projects we were trying to do some test driven stuff and uh, it failed and next project we uh, started from scratch again. So this talk based on my experience and especially on my last project where we are starting from scratch doing everything test driven and um, we figured out pretty soon that we were doing it somehow intuitive right, but it wasn't really a test driven development as you might find it in the book. So I thought, okay, what we are really doing, I want to be able to repeat that and uh, look into it to find kind of a systematic approach or maybe the science behind what we were doing. Um, and yeah, that's uh, the basement of uh, this talk. First of all, we asked ourselves this question, um, uh, how can we validate that our API is working as intended? That's a quote from Steve Kartnick. If you don't know him, check him out, he's a great API guy. Um, and uh, this was uh, definitely a question we tried to, ca to tackle. Um, but if we want to validate uh, that our API is working as intended, we should uh, make sure what is really working as intended, what's the intention we have. So uh, before we can start with uh, building an API, we should know what we're really, really doing, what should our um, API um, get as an input, as a request, and what's so supposed to be the response, right? So uh, and what's some magics might happen uh, in the middle somewhere. Um, but we thought, hey, no problem, we are developers, so what are we gonna do when we want to validate something? For sure, we write a test. And if we even do that first, uh, we can call this test driven development, then we are agile, um, cool, that's awesome, let's do this. Um, it turned out pretty soon that it wasn't that easy to do that. Um, and it wasn't trivial at all, it was uh, kind of a pain in the ass to uh, apply this test driven development cycle, you probably all know, um, to our project. Because we were trying to, uh, to write unit tests, um, first of all, for sure we write uh, a failing unit test, uh, then we try to make it pass, do some refactoring, and go the, circle or the cycle over and over. Um, but right, right away after we started, we figured out what, what we are really doing right now here. Um, what is uh, the unit here? And uh, we got a specification from our clients and was more like, okay, we wanna have uh, this input, we wanna have this output, and so uh, we were kind of stuck because we were tackling the question, what is really our unit and how can we turn our specification into tests? And that reminded me somehow um, on this the uh, TDD is dead discussion, some of you might know, um, between uh, David Heinemar Hansen, uh, Martin Fowler, and Ken Beck. Uh, if you're not familiar, this, uh, this discussion occurred, of course, 
David states uh, that uh, TDD can cause design damage when you're really focusing some on the inside and you leave out the bigger picture. Um, go, don't want to go, go into that in more detail, but um, that was actually what I felt, that uh, we were focusing so much on the inside that we missed out totally what's really going on with our FEI. Because it's uh, the FEI is something which is going on more from the outside to the inside and not like here, that you're going from the inside to the outside. Um, because when you're building an API, uh, your uh, architecture might look like this. It's just an example architecture, maybe it's looked totally different, but I just want to outline that when, you're, when we're talking about APIs, we have several types of clients. Maybe we have a mobile client, single page application, some services, whatever, and behind that, different kinds of client. We have lots of lots of layers. It's not, the API is just uh, the, f you can, my, maybe the front end, that's what our clients will see. And um, behind, down the, uh, underneath this, uh, this API, we have a business logic, maybe we're de dealing with asynchronous tasks, using message queue, maybe salary, uh, and if we use Django, we might have an ORM or some other historical grown stuff like a notification system we had in this one client's project which were triggering some external services. So uh, some weird stuff is going on everywhere. Lots of talking in both directions. So that's uh, kind of horrible to, to test. Um, one way to do that is definitely that you mock everything, that you go back to your uh, traditional TDD approach where you have this isolation, this isolated units uh, where you um, don't have to think about what's going on over there, what's going on over there. And uh, you can just uh, focus on uh, your current unit. But um, I highly recommend not to isolate uh, your API. It it's, uh, won't be natural. So uh, um, what we did is that we were more focusing uh, from the outside to the inside. And uh, that's actually pretty easy when, you, when we're talking about APIs. Because the coolest thing about an API is as I already mentioned. Um, we have a defined output, I hope you can read it. Looks a bit, uh, uh, yeah, thin, okay. Uh, but this is just uh, a simp an example for an API request. Uh, this uh, client project I was talking about is about mailbox providers, so uh, it's just why I'm using a mailbox endpoint. Uh, um, but if we have a defined uh, input, our response, and we, we have defined output, um, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to um, um, to build tests on that if you uh, look at the bigger picture and if you really um, lose your focus from the units. If you're um, uh, focusing, that's my input, I will implement the behavior uh, and I will uh, turn this into a specified output. Um, There's probably way more than just these two uh, inputs and outputs. Uh, we had. Uh, some really, really huge uh, uh, specification with lots of error codes and also some more details uh, what we should implement. But um, you can definitely do that with TDD and um, you can apply your test uh, for an API. And um, if we look at the different kinds of tests we have, um, we should maybe rethink uh, what we were really doing with our tests. These are two definitions that we I like a lot. Um, they're kind of handy there, also the first one is unknown. Um, um, it's more about uh, when we focus on unit tests, we were focusing um, how to, that we write the code correctly, that, we, uh, that we've written the, uh, the code right. Um, and that's definitely important that we make sure that we, uh, that we're comparing our dictionaries correctly or whatever, we, uh, that we are more that we impl do the implementation, the basics, uh, in the right way. But uh, if we're talking about APIs, uh, we might have a client, and this client is uh, maybe the, the office next door, or it's a, uh, if you're, it's a public API, you even might know your client. And uh, they care that, if we go back to the example from this slide before, that the mailbox is created um, in the right way. But um, if there's some error, deep inside, um, who should this client know? He doesn't really care about that. It's, 
it's more about uh, just getting a job done, give me the results, and uh, I have no idea what's going on, so that's some magic, that's a black box. Uh, so the acceptance tests, they confirm that we really built the right software so that we built the right API for our clients. Um, so uh, if you're focusing too much on your, uh, ex on your unit tests, uh, something like this might happen, that everything is correct, you build the, uh, the, ra the right code and uh, you have no errors, you wrote a tremendous amount of uh, unit tests, but it's not working. Your API is doing the wrong thing and your client is arguing what's going on here. Um, so we should make sure that we uh, cover our specification with our tests and that's in, in general if you're talking about acceptance tests, that's end-to-end -end tests but uh, acceptance tests are way more. They are not just integration tests where you go from the one side to the other side. Um, we also had some acceptance tests uh, which were uh, more unit oriented. For example, we had some special requirements how uh, an email address um, um, should be checked if, the, if it's available or not. Um, maybe you have some uh, requirements uh, to check if you're if the email address is blacklisted or traced by the NSA, whatever. Um, so there are various levels what you really can check with uh, if you turn your specification into an, uh, into an acceptance test. It's not just end-to-end -end tests, it's functional tests, unit tests. And if you're done with that and you're covered uh, the specification of your, um, of your API, then you can go to the next step and think about more what we can um, how can we validate that we write uh, the correct code? And that brought us to um, another cycle some of you might know, the BDD cycle, the Behavior Driven Development. Um, this, uh, Dan Noss came uh, up with this cycle a couple of years ago. Um, it's kind of similar to what we did. Uh, we, did we haven't done BDD, but uh, we used the cycle of BDD. Um, so what we did is that we, uh, turned all the whole specification into acceptance tests. So we wrote, uh, first of all, a tremendous amount of uh, acceptance tests uh, to fulfill the specification. So which uh, error code should we turn if uh, we got this uh, request and um, also uh, how we uh, well gonna validate if this email address is available. So all this stuff and after we've uh, We've covered this uh, this endpoint. Then we went to the next step. So we thought, okay, maybe it makes sense to make sure that we really uh, do the assertion uh, for our input in the right way. So we add some uh, unit tests um, more on um, on our level how we think that makes sense to uh, to increase uh, the test coverage there. And then we started to make it pass. So it was uh, a long way to get everything green but uh, it, pay, it paid out in the end. Um, we, um, um, we, were, we were able to make sure that um, we uh, built the, the right API and uh, that we were able to refactor um, all our code without uh, um, going, uh, getting away uh, from, the, uh, uh, from what our client expects. And uh, may maybe if you do some uh, uh, maintenance work and you already have released your API and you have some uh, versioned endpoints, it's pretty important that you uh, stick to your um, implementation that you don't change uh, the behavior of your API in there. With this cycle, we were totally able to make that. Uh, it was a lot of effort, definitely. Um, we did this just with PyTest. We didn't use Gherkin. That's uh, the BDD syntax. It's a uh, domain-specific language where you can write your tests more beautiful, but um, our team was just uh, just development team. We all, everyone was a developer, also the project manager, so we decided, okay, we just, we already started. Wouldn't make sense to us to use uh, Gherkin for that. Um, so we wrote our tests like that, and uh, we ended up with kind of these numbers. Um, that's uh, from a 12 months project, so, um, uh, we wrote a lot of tests, uh, uh, not 100% accurate, but it was around 3,000 tests, uh, 2,000 unit tests. Um, so we added a lot of uh, additional tests which uh, weren't uh, really required by uh, our uh, specification, but uh, it was still necessary to, uh, 
to loop over this uh, normal TDD cycle after we, um, uh, we completed the acceptance test cycle. And uh, we built um, a tremendous amount of uh, PyTest pictures to do that. And um, of course we were able to uh, create our uh, test architecture um, in a deterministic way. And that brings us actually to the next uh, slide. Um, our test architecture. Just a, a quick, um, um, yeah. What just want to outline pretty in a, uh, pretty quickly because it's definitely project related and that might not work for everyone. But I think at least this uh, bullet points uh, might be handy. Um, what we did is that we isolated uh, our uh, integration tests uh, in a different project. Um, we, we did that because we, we want to make sure that it's not possible to sneak around and to uh, call the function in a way you're not supposed to do it. Um, your developers doesn't, ha doesn't have to be mean, um, but maybe they're, uh, they're tired and they find a way around and they're not testing in the way it's supposed to be. If you put it, all your stuff in a separate project, there's uh, no other way you have to do uh, it in the right way. You have to call the API. And, um, if you're dealing with public APIs, um, what I ha did in another project uh, was, it's a really good idea that you uh, build your test suite uh, with, your, uh, with the SDK, SDK you're shipping to your clients. Um, you should definitely also have some tests without this uh, SDK, so because it's also something you, you definitely have to test, but um, you should, uh, um, bring yourself in the same position as your client is when he's testing or when he's using your API that you can definitely validate that this, uh, that your tests are kind of, um, um, kind of a, a picture of the reality. Um, it's not imaginary what you're really doing. Um, we put the, uh, the normal tests, like the function tests and unit tests, definitely in a normal test project. Um, but we use uh, Debian packages for that. Uh, that's probably a totally different talk. It's not uh, trivial to, to ship your stuff in Debian packages, but if you already try to do that and you feel comfortable with that, uh, we had some really good experience to uh, capture all dependencies in, ca in Debian packages to uh, make sure that um, we can really isolate our, um, uh, our integration tests um, in another package and also the other acceptance tests work very well, but uh, it's definitely kind of tricky. I don't want to go into that in more detail. Uh, what we also did is that we just mocked external services. Uh, we were in a situation where we think, okay, maybe it's cool if we mock uh, uh, our, um, our la uh, one layer or some other endpoints we were using uh, inside of our API, inside of our ecosystem, um, but we decided uh, that we're not doing that. Uh, of course, uh, if we were mocking internal, um, we might have uh, it easier to test, but we're also uh, losing kind of, uh, yeah, some, uh, some other information when we, um, when we are um, testing all the isolated stuff. So um, it's difficult to really give some advice how we designed our tests, um, but what we, try to do um, all the time is to uh, test from the beginning to the end. So if you're testing your business logic, go from business logic uh, down to your database, don't mock some, uh, some layers underneath. And if you're testing your, um, your API, test from the API um, down all the layers uh, that you're not skipping something. Um, also, if you use uh, Celery, for example, it's something I will talk uh, about in a minute. Um, use the whole, uh, the whole layers. Um, it's um, definitely a lot of test effort you have to do, but if you do that, uh, uh, you can make sure that uh, this whole uh, communication is working. Of course, there's a lot of talking going on between all these layers. Um, you might know the, the first principle, that's the TDD principle. Uh, we try to apply it for our tests. It stands for uh, fast, isolated, uh, repeatable, 
safe verifying timely tests. So that's you should uh, design your tests in that way. Um, it kind of worked for our tests, but not 100%, uh, especially the first point fast. Um, in the end, we, ha uh, we had some big issues with dealing with that to um, get our um, uh, test for environment set up. It took uh, um, almost one to two seconds per test. That's uh, kind of hilarious if you're running 3,000 tests. Uh, we, uh, we were able to optimize that, but there was definitely a sticking point to uh, if you want to create a deterministic environment that you and you have some uh, complex uh, stuff going on that you're still on time. Um, so doing this fast, it's not that easy. Um, finally, we ended up with uh, 45 minutes for uh, this uh, 3,000 test. I think that's um, still doable, definitely to uh, do that each time if you do uh, um, continuous integration, if you want to run this test all the time. But uh, we did that on a, um, yeah, our base. Uh, the isolation, um, yeah, I talked about that uh, already. Uh, we mocked just external services, so we isolated um, not everything. We isolated ourselves from the outside, but not from the inside. Uh, but we were still able to make it repeatable to uh, create a deterministic environment um, with uh, using uh, PyTest fixtures. Um, and uh, yeah, self-verifying the S, that's kind of obvious. That just means that you uh, should assert uh, the stuff you want to test inside of your tests. Um, the T, the timely, um, in the first, uh, when we started off with this, was definitely 80% uh, writing test code and 20% writing uh, production code. But uh, it shifts over time. So uh, nowadays, we are pretty quick with setting up new tests and uh, getting it running and we are kind of focusing more on the production code, and that's definitely pretty good. Um, yeah, to do that, we built a lot of helper classes um, to make that possible. Um, we uh, um, yeah, we uh, were able to use this helper class for our PyTest fixtures to create a deterministic environment, and I uh, don't want to go that much into the fixtures because there was really much um, related to, uh, to the project, and it's but uh, we cleaned our database and our, our MWIS pictures and created a lot of test data. And what we also did was pretty easy, actually. I just uh, I figured out during the project that you can test your version endpoints uh, very handy with, uh, with PyTest, actually. Um, that's something I just want to outline pretty quick. Um, if you're uh, using the Django REST framework, for example, and you're versioning your endpoints, um, you might have this uh, versioning class where you have a set with all your version endpoints. And with PyTest, you can just uh, parameterize your tests um, where you just create a list out of the set and uh, put every, um, um, every item of this, uh, of this list into your parameter inside of your test so that you're able to test every, uh, every version endpoint. That's actually pretty cool of you. Um, version your endpoints. Um, actually, I, I highly recommend to version your endpoint instead of API. I did it in the other way as well, but um, um, yeah, <laughs> and, um, I felt it's uh, easier to test if you just version your endpoints. And uh, like this, you can still make sure that your endpoints still behave as supposed to do, to do, because um, you normally don't copy your uh, code when you version an endpoint. The business logic uh, underneath your API is supposed to be still the same. If it's not, you're probably doing something mysterious, and it's supposed to be a new endpoint, I guess. We also um, work with a lot of asynchronous behaviors. I was, um, I showed you um, a kind of similar architecture in the beginning. And uh, there was actually uh, one layer of complexity. It, uh, I would say it, br it brought a new dimension of complexity in our project uh, when we were making our API asynchronous. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, when, you're, when a client is uh, talking to an endpoint, this endpoint uh, starts a salary task. So it starts an, um, it schedules, uh, a task inside a message queue, and this is going to be processed later on by uh, a worker. 
um, but we had to respond to our client immediately. So you have a delta um, between the uh, response and the reprocessing, and you should make sure that you know how to deal with that. Um, of course, there's um, still a lot of talking going on, and uh, the client uh, won't wait for your pr uh, for the processing. Um, but uh, we did it like this. Um, first of all, if you do that, beware of the salary cache. Um, I spent nights uh, with this cache with this cache issue. Um, um, salary cache is trans uh, transaction IDs um, that can be dangerous uh, if you're not uh, creating your transaction IDs on demand. Uh, we haven't done that all the time. Um, so sometimes uh, you might end up with some mysterious response uh, and you thought, okay, actually I should get something totally different, but um, yeah, um, your endpoint is still cash and salary. Can be tricky. Um, but what we actually did to make this uh, happen, to uh, create this asynchronous uh, API, we, val we validate the import first um, to make sure that from the state we have right now, um, everything is right and we can uh, respond uh, with a correct error code or with a uh, correct success code to our client. And um, then we started uh, our job, um, but between this we have this delta and this also, this, the, the time delta between the processing and uh, the, uh, the validation is pretty tricky. That's something you, you should really be aware of and really test. We tested in, uh, this in various ways and testing some um, uh, some values, kind of the um, uh, the boundaries. Um, um, so the, um, what's happening before uh, this, uh, before we pass this time data and what's happening afterwards uh, um, so that you're still able to handle um, in your process uh, your data when uh, the, data, the state of your data changed between uh, the validation and now. And to uh, be able to uh, validate this in your, uh, in your test, it's necessary that you are able to access the asynchronous results of your tests. Um, we wrote some helper function for that, but it's <coughs> actually not that difficult. I will show, I will show you uh, an example in a minute. Um, of course, what we also did is that we um, waited for uh, our um, asynchronous task in every test. So what we did is we had a, um, a fixture called uh, clean database, we, uh, which we're using in every test. This, was, this picture was doing kind of the, um, the setup, the, the base setup for, uh, um, for the test cleaning the database and creating also some stuff. And this uh, picture also waited for all tests, which, uh, for all tasks which were still running. And if we were uh, in a situation where we needed some uh, special results um, of, uh, of a test, uh, of a task, we also waited at the end of uh, this test for this task. And we, um, we did this with a pretty easy helper class, actually, a uh, helper method. Um, you can just uh, grab your results from, um, from your salary task uh, and um, yeah, collect them, uh, give them back, or what we just did in this simple method. We just waited for them that every uh, task responds the result. Mm. Yeah, and uh, this salary thing brought us uh, also uh, a tremendous amount of more tests. Of course, we were in a situation that we're not just testing our business logic and our API, we also had to test our salary task. Uh, but that was not that bad. Of course, uh, we were just uh, we're doing this with uh, some PyTest uh, parameter, parameterized stuff uh, that we were able to test the salary task and uh, the task without salary in one test. Um, that's definitely one thing I, I highly recommend when you do that, that you're uh, just uh, using PyTest for that. Because uh, otherwise we would probably end up with way more than 3,000 tests if we would write a test for each of this layer. Um, but if you do this test, if you write all these tests, um, this doesn't mean that you really write uh, a good API. If your speci specification is still um, horrible and uh, you're doing test-driven development, 
it, it won't turn your, uh, your specification into something awesome. Um, and that brings me to a quote I, I like a lot from uh, Kent Beck that um, test room development um, won't uh, make your design good, but it can help you to avoid bad design. And I think that's uh, something what we did with our test room development approach that uh, we knew what we want to have and we were we invested a, a lot of time in the specification in the beginning and then we make sure that we can really achieve that. Um, uh, and um, we, um, we did that um, uh, with some, um, yeah, in some various ways. Uh, maybe um, you heard about the, uh, the inverse combi maneuver. That's um, something what uh, cost us some, uh, yeah, actually some nights to, because uh, uh, the combi maneuver states that the organization tends to produce software designs which looks like the organization or your, or your communication structure. And that's caused some uh, unintended friction points and you actually don't wanna have an API that looks like your organization or your underlying system. Um, you won't really have an API that, um, um, yeah, that's the product your customer sees or that's uh, the API your developers love. So um, we were designing our API in our inside of our development team and uh, actually were saying, okay, what we are really doing, that's the definitely API we wanna use, but what about the guys outside? Will they really use our API? Um, so, um, from um, my point of view, it's pretty important that you um, uh, encourage uh, your your whole team and also some uh, the guys who are responsible for the business side and some uh, some developers from outside of the development team to bring input to the design that you uh, avoid that you are just uh, stick in your uh, small narrow view and uh, create a design that really looks like uh, how you communicate. Uh, between your uh, layers and between your uh, organization that you get some input from outside and if you do that and if you have the specification I was talking, I'm talking about the whole time, then you're able to achieve uh, a great specification, a great, great design with your tests. And that's actually kind of the inverse commune maneuver that you uh, achieve um, the desired design. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, uh, an API design is more a thing from the outside. So um, we were, um, it took us a while, but we were after um, <coughs> some time, we were still focusing what's going on outside. And then we were trying to evolve the design from the, uh, from the outside to the inside. It doesn't mean that you're, uh, um, that you're doing some, um, yeah, REST equals CRUD or stuff, or that your, API, that your database is looking directly like, like, like your API. It doesn't mean that, but you should make sure that um, you're designing an API which, um, um, and, and the needs of this API are served by your database and your layers underneath. Um, and if you do that, uh, if, you, uh, uh, yeah, if you're writing all those tests, you can make sure that you can uh, definitely refactor uh, without changing your behaviors, what, which is pretty helpful when you uh, especially develop a uh, public API. And uh, I already mentioned the, uh, the version endpoints. We, um, uh, I figured out uh, once that I still have a version endpoint. Um, I forgot it actually. And when we uh, built in this uh, picture, I, I showed that it um, yeah, can, be, uh, can be tricky. Um, okay, I have to speed up. I just have a minute left. Uh, so I would like to show you my lessons learned. Um, first of all, I mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, you need a, if you really want to build a great API, if you want to do test development for API, think about your specification first. Build, um, make a great specification. If you have a great specification with your uh, business on the side and with, with some external developers, maybe some lead devs from other teams, you will. Um, have a great um, design which comes from outside. Um, yeah, don't forget your version endpoint and uh, don't underestimate the effort you will, will need to test uh, asynchronous behaviors uh, in your API. If you really need asynchronous behaviors in APIs as we did, um, um, plan, plan in some extra time. Um, of course, uh, 
we didn't. Um, that's the reason why it took us uh, 12 months to finish this project. And um, another point is definitely that uh, all this complexity which we brought into this project uh, made it more and more difficult to create really a deterministic environment, uh, which is definitely necessary when you want to do uh, some test-driven development and we want to test it in, a, in the right way. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot and use test room development for your API in the future. Okay. We have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you're testing uh, Celery. I'm just wondering why you didn't use Celery always eager. Pardon? Hi. I'm just wondering why you didn't use Celery always eager. Um, why we use Celery? Yep. Okay. No, no, um, no, no, no. So that's not the question. The question is why you didn't use Celery always eager. It's a mode that turns off the asynchronous behavior. Um, uh, why, why we had the synchronous behavior, do you mean? No. Um, uh, can you speak a bit louder? I'm sure. Slower. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I didn't so get every word. Okay, Celery has a mode called always eager. Yeah. Which turns off the asynchronous behavior. Yeah. I'm wondering why you didn't use it. Oh, that. okay, yeah, sure. Um, uh, I mean, if we create our uh, test environment uh, in a synchronous way, it won't represent our uh, um, environment which we have in production. So you're totally right that we could do all the stuff uh, in a synchronous way. Um, and um, we kind of created the synchronous uh, environment by uh, writing a lot of helper classes and uh, using this additional fixtures to do that. Um, and um, we did that course, um, if we just uh, trigger a switch to make it synchronous, uh, it's, some, it's not our application anymore and we would have a um, different behavior and we actually we were interested in, in testing what's really going on the real world. That's why we did that. But you totally right, it would be probably the easier way to do that. Um, yeah. Hi, um, just a curiosity. Um, I wanted to know if you uh, wrote, maybe beforehand, um, acceptance tests for non-functional requirements, because sometimes non-functional requirements hit you in the back uh, later during development, like for performance or things like that, experience problems or anything like that. Okay. Um. So say you write your API, but you want response time to be less than three seconds and things like that. So an acceptance test does not necessarily, if it's functional, does not necessarily catch that. It catch the, catches the response yeah. the output, but not the performance. So sometimes we think later about those problems. Mm -hmm. um, so unless there already was a specification. Yeah. So if you were asking for your experience. Yeah, the performance is issues are definitely a uh, total different uh, task. Uh, we um, we uh, put all this performance stuff outside of our normal normal test suite. Uh, we had some um, uh, actually we had some KPIs for uh, special endpoints we had to fulfill, but um, that was not part of our, uh, how we did this test driven. To um, we wrote um, our endpoints. Uh, at first with this um, cycle I, I showed you and afterwards we, uh, we wrote some um, uh, performance tests. Um, of course, we were also waiting for some additional information what really our KPIs are. Um, but yeah, we had to do that. Uh, but uh, to do that inside of the, uh, the cycle would just make the cycle more longer. But maybe it's, an, uh, it's possible to, to integrate that. Uh, that's definitely an, um, a point which is also important for the design in some way. You're right. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier on that you started off writing more test code than production code. Right. And then eventually that transitioned to more production code than test, test code. You also mentioned that the project took you about 12 months to write. Can you tell me what point along that line the transition happened? Like what point it went more than 50% production code? Approximately. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's tough. That's a tough question. Um, I should look into my uh, commit list. Um, <laughs> um, just, I, just I, can't, I, can't so. I can't really tell you that. It's um, when we started off to have uh, kind of a, a basic set of the fixtures we need all the time, 
um, for example, a, mail, a, st a standard mailbox or a domain for a mailbox, and uh, also the uh, the handlers to uh, make sure how we deal with salary and how we uh, able to um, create our uh, environment at first. This took probably um, uh, yeah a couple of uh, of weeks to do that, and then. Uh, we had to implement an, uh, something totally different, a new endpoint. So it was like uh, we we finished this for one endpoint, and then we had to deal with some totally different endpoints where we had this uh, um, this issue again, where we had to start off and uh, to create new pictures. So it was not really a straight line, um, but maybe it's like this: that you do this for. Uh, for a week for one endpoint, and then it's getting way faster, and then you go to the next endpoint, you have this slow period, and uh, then you get more into, then you can speed up. So um, it probably depends how you implement your API, but for us it was uh, not definitely not a straight line to where you can say, okay, we did that uh, for three months, and then everything was cool, we were speeded up, and we were able to finish uh, on time, absolutely not. Okay, yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time for any more questions, but uh, thank you again, Michael. Yeah, thank you.